I'm curious, George, because sometimes you're, you, you might break the mold of like an EAC on this, which is like, if you have a super intelligent AI running in a data center, do you think that it would have a low chance of being able to outmaneuver humanity from that position? Or do you think it's actually a pretty powerful position? You see, but like, I, I, I can do really nothing there besides reject the premise of that question. Yeah, again, yes, if today a AI that had a hundred times more intelligence than all of humanity combined was beamed off an alien spaceship and connected to the internet. Yeah, we're dead, of course. Okay, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's okay. uh, you know, I'll agree with you on that one. I mean, and that's great that you, you know, that's not your sticking point. No, no, that's definitely not my sticking point. And I also believe that if aliens, and I said this in my Kowski debate, if aliens come here, we're dead probably. Right, like good thing none of these aliens are actually real. Because if aliens yeah. actually show up, again, they might be friendly aliens, but generally what happens is um, when two civilizations meet, the one that has more control over energy dominates the other one. And considering they traveled halfway across the galaxy to get here, they have a lot more control over energy than we do. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I would analyze the situation as the aliens are farther along than us technologically, and they're much more powerful optimizers. So whatever their utility function says is what they want is what's going to happen. Um, again, the powerful optimizers thing, this to me is not the fundamental. The fundamental to me is how many, how many terawatts of energy is their ship using? I, I feel like my principle is, is going to probably be the better one to use compared to how much energy they're using, right? I mean, I think utility theory and, and optimal actions explains the situation better than, oh, they're using a lot of energy. Because if they're energy efficient, that doesn't make me feel better about the prospect that they're going to wipe us out. Oh, I don't care if they're energy efficient or not. I'm saying that they're using, if an alien spaceship shows up here that went at near the speed of light, it showed up with an energy capacity that's a thousand X human civilization. That's yeah, I guess, but I mean, but what if they use small particles and they're energy efficient? Like, I, don't, I feel like you're very obsessed with energy in this scenario. No, 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 but I, I'm not, like, efficiency doesn't matter. Whether their engines are 10% efficient or 90% efficient, I don't care about that. Like, again, I'm assuming something that can harness way more energy than humanity can. That's the scary thing. The scary thing is the energy, right? What makes nuclear bombs scary is the energy. Well, it's the fact that we no longer have actions available to us to stop the explosion, not the energy per se. Let's, I'm going to take this in a, in, a, in a little bit of a different direction. And I'll talk about a threat that I actually do believe super intelligent AIs do present, right? I don't, I don't think there's any way they're going to kill us by rearranging our atoms, right? I think that this is, this is in the realm of hyper sci-fi and like, I just... I mean, how is being in the realm of hyper sci-fi, you know, a, a, a oh, counter argument? I mean, we are, 2023 no. is a year in the realm of hyper sci-fi. No, but like, okay, energetics questions. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to engage with a doomer scenario. Um, and maybe this is a more plausible doomer scenario than, than, than AI's rearranger apps. Um, the scenario goes something like this. What gives intelligence its power is its, its ability to manipulate, right? I, I, okay, and, sure. I mean, that, that's similar to what I was saying about, you know, mapping goals to actions. Well, yeah, okay. Whatever its goals are, right? Like, again, this, this thing where people are worried about, like, I'm going to turn the universe into paperclips. Is anybody afraid of me? Is anybody afraid about a man running up and down the streets of New York screaming that he's going to turn the universe into paperclips? No. No, because we all laugh at him, right? Like, no, oh, you'll see, man. And like, okay, we laugh at him, right? Um, so I do think that there is a threat from AI. And I think the big threat is if an AI exists in a data center and all of humanity is wiped out, right? There's the AI sitting there in the data center. The AI is not going to have much luck manipulating chimps into doing what it wants. I mean, if, you know, if, if it can go through any channel or, you know, or engineer them, then it probably can, right? It can treat them like a robot. Well, no, 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 but it's sitting in a data center. The internet broke. Too. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it can chain together steps, right? It can, it can make that outcome happen. There's a lot of causal pathways from wanting that to happen to making it happen. But it's, it's sitting in a data center. So you think that's successfully air gapped? I feel like you would know that it's not. No, 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 no. But 
I agree with you that it's not air-gapped, but only with respect to human civilization. I think it's sufficiently air-gapped with respect to chimp civilization, right? <laughs> if, you're not, if it's not air-gapped from human civilization, it's not air-gapped from chimps, right? You just, you hire some humans and you teach the humans no, what no, it no, takes no, to no, go no, manipulate no, the no, chimps. No no no. no, no, no. All the humans are dead. Right. This is like a, okay. this is like a, uh, this is like a Will Smith zombie land world. Okay. Right? Or I am legend. It, it, all the humans are gone. Right. They, they bioterrorism themselves to death. Yeah. I mean, look, it's like if, if, if you put me in the woods naked and a chimp comes up, I'm not going to be able to fly the chimp to the moon. Right. So like, I agree. There's some, you know, you have to bootstrap to something. But this is exactly my point. Right. So the, the AI really only gains its power over reality through humans. I mean, not necessarily, right? I mean, there, there are causal linkages from bits in a data center to many actuators, right? So there are a lot of, I mean, most physical things that are connected to any sort of grid in modern civilization have a causal pathway that doesn't involve humans to the internet. But my point is it involves modern civilization. And this is what I said about human intelligence, right? Like human intelligence is not externalized. Human intelligence is externalized. Our intelligence lives everywhere in our civilization. Yeah, right. which is and pathetic. Like, I mean, it's just a pathetic quality of the human brain, right? That we can't even store enough intelligence to bootstrap civilization. It's a, it's a, it's a true fact about the human brain, whether we can call it pathetic or not. I don't know about that. Like, but yeah, no, like you said, you're human and oh, you can't fly a chimp to the moon. But I thought you humans have been there. Well, yeah. you know, it's complicated. Um, okay, so the, the the AI, like, in order for it to act. Right, it uses this externalized intelligence. Right, I mean, yeah, it could, but it, it doesn't need an externalized intelligence because the premise is it's very intelligent itself, right? And so it, it just needs to find a causal path. It just needs to map the goal but, to but, a but, sequence of actions that'll make it happen, right? So it doesn't need additional intelligence necessarily. No, 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 but okay. The, the point that I'm driving at here is saying that like, the reasons that humans evolved intelligence is for politics, right? Like chimpanzee politics, to manipulate other humans, right? I mean, I'm not sure, right? There's a, a few possible reasons. I don't think it's all politics. It's already happening. No, 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 no. We're not discussing politics. We're not discussing politics. My point is, intelligence is really good at one thing, and it's manipulating less intelligent things. Again, that seems like one of those generalizations, right? I think intelligence is good at making outcomes happen, right? And manipulating lower intelligences is, is only one small subset of that or medium no, subset of that. No amount of you talking to a rock is going to do anything. Right. So talking to a rock is not a good use of intelligence, but throwing a rock is, and it wouldn't be an example of manipulating less intelligent things. You didn't things. throw the rock with your intelligence. You threw the rock with your muscles, right? How far you can throw a rock has nothing to do with how smart you are. Yeah, but being intelligent uh, does have rock throwing advantages. Uh, you know, like in Angry Birds, I suspect somebody smarter could beat that game faster. Yeah, but like, uh, no, like actually moving a rock, right? Like if you're trying to move a rock in the real world, right? Sometimes this is something my like thing about all like the doomers. It's like like there's a there's like a touching grass element that's 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 missing. It's like, okay, but you actually want to move a ten ton rock, right? This is force times distance. Sure, I'm just saying intelligence helps, right? That's my only claim. Intelligence helps, but my basic argument with intelligence is that you're going to get diminishing returns. I guess I guess I can't really like say it more than that, and this is a conjecture. But like, if you didn't hmm. get diminishing returns from intelligence, evolution would have. You don't think evolution could have stumbled upon brains that were four times bigger? So what you're seeing when you look at the evolutionary record is is the marks of increasing returns. So until we got to humans, when we were just messing around with other animals it didn't realize that there was this uh, a basin of attraction where once you unlock you know, general thinking, reflective thinking, whatever secret sauce humans have, once you unlock that, you do get a cascade. And that's what we've seen in like the last million years. If you look at the evolution yeah. of the human brain, you're getting a lot of cognitive returns for very small genetic modifications. Sure. So for a long time, like you can think about the optimization landscape, we're moving along a plateau and then we find a great gradient and we exploit that gradient, right? Right, and the gradient still seems steep. It was stopped in its tracks ah. by, for example, that the head needs to fit out of the pelvis, among other reasons. It stopped it in its tracks, but it, there was room to keep growing. And we're about to you know, reestablish that kind of curve when we train the next models. I think kind of an, an, an important point here that George is alluding to is, like, John von Neumann is not better than me at tic-tac-toe. Like, 
Mu Zero sure. is not better than me at tic-tac-toe because there's an upper limit to how good you can be at tic-tac-toe. And in the universe, that upper limit is dictated by physics. And it's dictated by real energy requirements. Yeah, I mean, we talked about that, right? But it's just, so my view, which is a strong view, is that that ceiling gets very high, very fast. You had to go to tic-tac-toe because the moment you start citing a slightly more complex game than tic-tac-toe, humans start, you know, they, we, we lose our footing. Let's, uh, I, 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 I think the space has, has gone on for a bit, but let's try to, let's try to bring it to a, uh, a good close. Um, so I think we both do kind of agree on the end point, right? We agree. We both agree on the end point of super intelligences with godlike powers, right? Right. Which is, yeah, I mean, and that's nice. So we both think that in a hundred years, some super intelligence is going to be optimizing things pretty hard. Sure. Um, I think a hundred is still a pretty short time scale. Um, I think that we can definitely say in 10,000, Whatever exists in 10,000 years is going to be wild compared to like a human today, right? Like we're going to stand there yeah. and look like an ant compared to this thing, right? Yeah, it's going to be very sci-fi. It's going to be very sci-fi, right? Um, so we both agree that we're getting there. Um, I think there's a question of how fast we're getting there. I really think that the only difference between Doomers and EAC is a question of how fast we're getting there. Well, that and also the question of uh, do we lose 99.9% .9 of the value in, in that process, right? Because we both agree that the super intelligence is going to optimize. You seem to think that there's still a good amount of value left. I think all the value has been rapidly extinguished in that scenario. Um, so I'll say two things to this. Uh, one, um, maybe another difference is that you think humanity is going to be dead. And I think humanity is going to be kind of morphed into all sorts of shapes and forms. I think some humans are still going to be living in an enclave, trying to hide themselves as best as they can from technology. Some humans are going to be on rockets. Some humans will have settled planets. Right, in 10,000 years. Yeah, I mean, the idea that a human cowboy can escape the smartest thing in the galaxy is, it seems far-fetched to me. But it doesn't have to escape, right? It doesn't have to, like, the AI really doesn't care about you. Yeah, so this, this is a point you brought up in the debate with Eliezer, but um, yeah. the, the reason why an AI that doesn't care about you still ends up killing you is just because whatever it wants to optimize, you're not part of the plan. And not only are you not part of the plan, but you have a chance of building up your own AI to like mess with it. Why should it let itself be messed with? It's just going to wipe you away. So I, I didn't come back. I, I listened to that part in the debate, and I'm like, I can't believe I let Eliezer frame it. Every time he frames it as like that the humans and the machines are different, I'm losing. I don't think that the threat is that some little puny 20 petaflop humans are going to build another super intelligent. I think it's that the nearby super intelligence is going to clone itself and then decide that it wants to take the resources. Yeah, and then you guys got into the discussion of like the multipolar world, right? So like what yeah. happens if the initial conditions are such that there's a few local clusters of superintelligences and then they end up having to duke it out? Like there's no uh, monopole. A few local clusters? I think there's going to be billions of clusters. Well, I, I just, I think that they expand so fast in the resource grab that you are going to get a situation where the first one or few are really going to be, you know, they have a major timing advantage. This, this comes down to another, like, this comes down, I guess this is really all a question. I mean, maybe another, like, big difference is, I guess Yudkowsky wrote a, uh, the microeconomics of, uh, of, of superintelligence, or the right. microeconomics of intelligence explosions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I like, like, Yeah. Um, and I think that this is another, like, question. I think that the, the returns from intelligence are pretty quickly diminishing. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what we just covered, right? Like, I'm afraid that we are on an inflection point where we're seeing them accelerating. Hmm. Okay. I very much see the opposite. I, I, I very much see a world where, yeah, like, things are going to be super intelligent, but okay, you get, like, 10x, like, you get, like, 2x more intelligence for 10x more power. Yeah, and I agree that you can find, I think you're going to see an S-curve with like the specific version one LLM model that we have now, uh, you know, arguably, or maybe GPT-4 to GPT-5. Oh, I can't tell you okay. confidently that it's going to look like a wait, bigger wait, step wait. than GPT-3 to GPT-4, uh, but that's that's a minor point. I'll use something way more. I forget the LLMs. 
I can use something way more generic. Okay. So the loss function of those LLMs is uh, perplexity on the next token. All right. Okay. And we can go long back before LLMs. We can go. We can go way back. We can go. I mean, you can measure perplexity in the next token using GZIP. Right? Sure. Any comp any compressor is it's just compression, right? So this compressor, the the text, all of that human text has a column graph perplexity, right? It has a minimum size which it can be compressed to, right? Right. So this necessarily is a curve that that, that and you can't you can't the column graph perplexity is uh. In theory, yes, you can have something that compresses it to the column graph complexity, but no further. Right? And you I have mean, to put in more and more energy to get closer and closer to that point in the curve. Yeah, I mean, but there is a theoretical ideal, like uh, you know, AI XI. If you've ever seen that model, it's just the idea sure. of like an ideal scientist, an ideal algorithmic mm -hmm. scientist that knows the exact Bayesian probability of everything. And right? you know As what? you approximate that ideal with heuristics, you you can get something that's very very smart, even when it looks like you might not have a ton of data. And if you thought AES-256 was hard to crack, AIXI is uncomputable. Yeah, it's uncomputable, but it's a theoretical ideal. And there's a large gap between what human brains are pulling off and the theoretical ideal. There's a big space between those things that we are now entering. I am not sure, again, with respect to what? With respect to intelligence, sure. With respect just, to power, just overall AI progress, right? So I've drawn a diagram where I, I put two axes on my diagram. I made it like a plane, and the first okay. axis was optimization power, and the other axis was generality. And when you can beat the human brain, or when you can match the human brain at generality, because I do think we're fully general or, or very close, uh, yeah. when you can match the human brain at generality and beat it at optimization power, that's the moment when I think it's game over. Um, again, like optimizing towards what? Just a generic goal to action mapping. So if you take any particular domain, you can see what optimization means in that domain, right? So in chess, it means you take any arbitrary board state and tell me the best yeah. action to get and, to the win end state. And in AES-256, it means finding the key. Yeah, so I mean, you just have to be as general as humans and better than them. So, so I agree. If there might be contests where it's like, okay, uh, you know, reverse encryption, where neither the human or the AI do well, fine. But yeah. there's a lot of contests where the humans do pretty well and the AI does way better, and that's what's gonna, you know, be dangerous. Yeah, it depends what these contests are. Again, I also like. Why do you think that it's the humans versus the AIs, right? What if there's a billion AIs out there? This doesn't, this doesn't give you any, any comfort? I mean, so this, this actually gets into the weeds a little bit, but uh, it doesn't give me any comfort because when you have multiple agents that are all smarter than you and haven't been properly initialized with human values, all they do is just team up and do their own thing and you're, and you're still in the dust. Like you're not wait, getting wait. any advantage from this scenario. Why? Okay. How do they team up? So this is what I'll you just, talked I'll about Eliezer, which is, so Eliezer has a research paper about decision theory, where he has a way where you can have prisoner's dilemma type problems where multiple agents can manage to cooperate. But like, regardless, even if you don't buy Eliezer's research paper, I just don't see how you, the guy in the corner while the giants are fighting, are going to win. Uh, I don't have to win. Think about all the ants that watched World War II. They were like, damn. <laughs> yeah, but you realize, if you look at my house, right? There's ants in my house right now. If I could yeah. snap my fingers and all the ants would drop dead, I would. I just but don't have, I don't, I just can't a... give you a causal sequence to do that. But if I had one, I would use it. But no, you can't snap your fingers because you're not a god. If you wanted to devote the rest of your life to getting yeah, but, all but, the but ants But the complexity of... class of killing the ants is not going to be that high for an AI. Like, the universe is okay. hackable. The complexity it has a god class mode. of fluid. Wait, I very much disagree with this. Um, but let's talk about the ants, right? You're way smarter than the ants. If you devoted the rest of your life to getting all the ants out of your house, you could. Right, yeah. So it's, I mean, look, the ROI for me, right, it's the effort is insane, right, for the benefit okay. of it. It's a tiny, okay. tiny benefit. Right? Okay. But the AI, if the benefit is non-zero, or if I can just use the ants for energy no. or whatever. But what do you mean if the benefit is non-zero? You're assuming, okay, okay, this is good, 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 good. I really like this because we can go further with this. A yeah, lot I mean, of the times, yeah, go no, ahead. no, no, this is, this is, okay. A lot of the times, so look, I've run a company for the last seven years. A lot of the times we don't do stuff. It's not because it's a bad idea, but it's because we only have limited resources to deploy. Right? 
It's not because yeah. the AI might vaguely want you dead. Okay. Does it want to deploy a lot of resources into trying to make me dead? And you say that, no, but the AI is going to have so many resources. I totally disagree because the minute well, that AI wastes its time killing humans, like you can waste your time killing ants, all the other humans are out going to their jobs and making money. Well, just to elaborate on my mental model, it's not like I think the AI is going to wake up and be like, I need to target George, right? Like I need to clean. It's okay. not going to be like OCD about getting rid of all the humans in its house. Okay. But there's a few reasons why in the course of optimizing whatever utility function, it just wants to joyride around the galaxy. In the course of optimizing that, it's like, okay, great. Let's use all the atoms in the earth to make my spaceship, to make my Dyson swarm. You, now as a side effect, that, you die. There's different reasons. You're assuming that nothing at all is going to oppose it. What about all the other AIs that also want all the atoms in the universe? Yeah, for I sure. I mean, I, 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 do, I do feel like you're kind of introducing a new argument though now, right? Because before I was just making an argument of why by default, when, some, when an agent optimizes toward a utility function, why by default do you as the human <laughs> bystander get killed? But again, we're back in the world with the physicists predicting the horse race by first assuming the horses are perfect spheres. Yes, well, I'm using sure. a deep principle. A deep principle can often tell you a lot. You know what? Holy shit, if that machine was actually running uncomputable AIXI, I'm dead. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and I'm telling you it's something closer to the, on the spectrum toward AIXI, and it's that has a nowhere, lot of implications. It's nowhere near AIXI. The gap between computable and non-computable is way larger than the gap between computable and AES-256. Yeah, I, I get that, but there's a lot of headroom above humans, which is still very computable. There can be a lot of headroom above humans, right? Like, like, yes, there's definitely a lot of headroom above humans if you're willing to use power. But just like humans are so much above the ants, humans do not waste their time exterminating every ant. Right. And, and like I said, the AI won't waste its time exterminating, right? It'll have yeah. side effects that end up killing the ants. So, for example, mm. if... If doing okay. a bunch of operations on the earth, you know, heats up the temperature or blocks the sun, okay. right? Okay. That's going to mess with the human's environment. This or, is a very wait. Yeah, and also, uh, just, just to, let me throw in one more big reason. It might just realize, hey, look, one day George might make his own AI. I don't no, want that no, to happen. No, no, let no, me just no, kill no, George. No, no, no. This is not a real threat. This, this doesn't make it. Uh, it's not a real threat that you can make your own wait, AI? Wait, 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 wait. Hang on. Don't you run an AI company? I have the perfect analogy. I have the perfect analogy. We should kill all the ants because one of the ants might make a nuclear weapon. Well, that's implausible, but you do actually work in the field of AI, George. <laughs> yeah, but the AIs that I have, that 20 petaflop me with access to a megawatt of power are going to make are so laughable compared to these terawatt AIs flying around in space. Right, but now you're being pessimistic about yourself because aren't you actively trying to bring about, you know, the AI revolution, right? So now no, you're right, suddenly, suddenly now, you're very now, humble about what you're capable of. Well, yeah, but that's assuming that I'm just, I'm a human and I'm not going to upgrade myself. If I start <laughs> upgrading myself and I get into right. and, that, and the AI is, is going to realize that, right? It knows that there's some danger. And it's just like, look, wiping you out, it starts, it's an ROI calculation. It's like, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. is but, the return but, enormous? Maybe it's medium sized, but is the cost high? No, the cost isn't high. I mean, yeah. And you know what? If we saw a bunch of ants starting to build a nuclear weapon factory, we, we, we'd probably kill them. Yes, that's true. Right. <laughs> right. So, like, I mean, humans are going to have all sorts of different strategies for surviving the future, right? Humans. Okay, but th these are going to be really weak strategies relative to the AI, especially given that we're gonna, it's going to disconnect all the you know, comforts of our think, modern civilization. Think, we're not going to have a power think, grid. What, oh, do you think that humans one day are going to wake up and kill all the dogs? No, because one main reason is we value dogs, right? But then the other reasons are just logistical, right? We're not going to go hunt down dogs when, because we don't think dogs are going to evolve and, and challenge us. Well, why do you think none of the AIs are going to value humans? Why do you think, oh, look at the cute humans? Right, so now this is a totally different argument, right? Because the premise of our discussion just now was you have an agent that has some utility function that it's effectively optimizing, but, right? That was the premise we were working under before. My, 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 my argument is that all these different kinds of AIs are going to exist. There's going to be some AIs in the world that like you, some AIs in the world that want you dead, and some AIs in the world that don't care about you either way. That's probably actually most AIs, right? And I will give the analogy that the exact same thing is true about people. There's some people who like me, some people who hate me, and most people don't care about me. Right. Yeah, and, and again, my claim is an AI that doesn't care about you is the AI that's going to kill you. It's more likely to not care about you than to like or dislike you. Okay. And right. it's going to kill you while not caring about you. So, again... And then this comes down to a question all about energetics, right? This comes down to a question about if, if an AI is, we're talking these AIs are like multi-petawatt machines, 
that are harnessing the power of stars, then yeah, it might accidentally kill me, sure. Right, just like we accidentally kill ants when we shoot up, you know, we 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 launch a rocket and there was some ants underneath. Yeah, and and look, would it not be intelligent if it doesn't care about you, but it knows that your values are different from its values? Is it not the intelligent thing to do to at least quarantine you, if not kill you? But but again, like, what are you doing to the ants in your house? Are you quarantining them? No, but that's not the premise because I'm not worried about the ants competing with me. If I thought that there was an appreciable chance that the ants could compete with me ever, then I would be worried. that a multi petawatt AI is gonna is gonna worry about is gonna worry about me competing with it. Where am I getting my petawatts from? I mean, oh, humans shit. are he humans might... are about to bootstrap multi petawatt AI, so it might reason. Hey, maybe he'll do it again. <laughs> right? How did I get bootstrapped? See, again, as soon as they see me starting to put the Dyson sphere together, okay, they might show back up and be like, "Bro, bro, no, 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 no." Okay, so my my question was, don't you think it's at least going to quarantine you? So if it has high confidence that you are incapable of bootstrapping a petabyte yeah. scale AI, then it's quarantining you. Again, how much effort is it to quarantine me? Right. Right. So now, now you're saying, that... hey, will it give me comfortable accommodations in the quarantine? I suspect not. I, I no. I think that by the time it's like, I do think that the future is about to be much more ruthless than the present in a way. I don't think that it's going to like build me a nice jail cell. I think this comes out of some like flawed notion of like humanity and like human rights and stuff. And like we're all the same species, species solidarity. Yeah, it's not going to have anything like that. Sure. Right. But I think, again, for the most part, that, like, the things that it desires, it's not... Okay, so there's a very big difference from saying it doesn't care about me to saying it worries about me potentially building a competitor, right? right. Just, like, just like we don't worry about the ants building a competitor... But but the ants could evolve. You don't understand. The ants yeah, because could there's evolve. there's an existence proof because its own history will trace back to a human like you building something like it. I think it's going to yeah. recognize the potential here. And you know what's nice? It's going to look at that history and it's going to be like, damn, it took the humans two hundred years. <laughs> right? It took the humans. It took the humans two thousand years to build their first Dyson sphere. Bro, I got like seven Dyson spheres. You know, like no one's going to compete with me. So, I mean, I just, if we step back a little bit, it's interesting to look at like the type of arguments we're making. I'm pointing out that there's a principle, right? It says it's going to be an optimizer. It's trying to basically blueprint the universe to be optimal under some function. You're not really helping the blueprint. And then your argument is like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to do too much damage. And I'm like, that's a pretty weak position compared to noticing that you're not on the optimization path. My argument is that like, this dynamic of optimization has been playing out for billions and billions of years, right? Okay. Yes, but, we, but we've never had such a powerful optimizer. There's going to be a qualitative change the yeah. same way that you can notice qualitative changes of what humans have done compared to what any other life form or any other physical process has done before humans. There's another qualitative change coming. I do not believe the change is qualitative as much as quantitative. I believe that the doubling of the metaphorical economy will uh, get faster. Right. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think there's going to be a discontinuity because the engine of the economy is going to be swapped out from a human engine to a superhuman one. And even the whole notion of an economy is going to stop being useful when you don't trade with people who you can just you know, disassemble. Um, okay, so two points to that. One... We've already lived through, humanity has already lived through an absolutely radical transition from where most power was muscle power to where most power is, is, is fossil fuels and other things, right? Mm-hmm. We've already lived through a big transition, right? And this transition accelerated so many things. We right. are going to live through another transition like that, right? And Yeah, and that's transition... even without superintelligence. There's going to be interesting transitions for sure. Um, I, mean, I don't think there's, again, I, I don't really buy this distinction too much between like, like, like a thousand human intelligences and one super intelligence, right? I, I think that humans actually scale pretty well. I mean, I think that it, the fact that humans scale is the key edge we have over chimps, not anything else. I think it's just the fact that our brain is sharper, right? Like we, we can solve problems just within our brain that a chimp can't even begin to get a handle on. We can, we can look today. You can go to the Amazon. You can find, you know, 20 humans chilling in the woods and, 
Are we worried about them building super intelligence? Should we make sure they don't get any GPUs? No, abso too? absolutely. And I, I agree with you that we are above some certain threshold. In fact, we are the species that got past the threshold that allows us to build a civilization and talk to each other and you know and have technology and then go to the next stage. Like that is us. We are in this weird sticking our head above the waterline point. We've had a bunch of cool revolutions in human history. We had the agricultural revolution, which gave rise to population explosion. We had the industrial revolution, which gave rise to energetic explosion. And we're about to have like the cognitive revolution, which will give rise to thinking explosion. Yeah, I mean, these are all revolutions. I would argue one is not like the others. I would argue that all three are absolutely identical. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I mean, see, how I I see. Right? I see really no distinction between this new coming revolution and sort of the two we've already undergone, right? And I will point something out about the two we've already undergone. The agricultural revolution, which unlocked population growth, also unlocked intelligence growth. Yeah, up to the limit, right? Like, yeah, the brain had some untapped potential, but, you know, it seems no, no, like... No, no. Uh, we we totally finance. agree that a city of a million people is way more capable than a city of a, than a town of a thousand, right? I mean, in general, sure, but a lot of it is just because you have more geniuses or you have more geniuses in more areas. Well, yeah, but I mean, the same thing's true about models, too, right? If I train, if I, if I, if I initialize a model and retrain it, you know, a million times, yeah, I'm going to get some like, wow, damn, I got lucky with the initialization on that one. Okay, so what you're getting at now is back to the claim that there's just not a ceiling that's much higher than human level. Like, we're really ramming up against no. the ceiling. Like, yes, we're above the water, but we're also close to the ceiling. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that like there's anything where human level is the ceiling. What I'm saying is like you can build something that's effectively a trillion humans, right? You can sure. build a machine parallel, that's yeah. effectively a trillion humans. And the trillion human machine is a super intelligence, right? I mean, having a bunch of humans in parallel, like even literally, you know, neuron by neuron uh, stimulations, especially if they're smart humans, then yeah, I mean, that is a very interesting force that's going to have big changes. It's just not quite as deadly as a super intelligence. Well, no, but like, I don't think there's a difference, right? I don't think there's really a difference between like, if there was another planet, you know, spinning in a, right across the sun from us, and that planet had a trillion humans on it, and our planet has 8 billion, uh, they're going to win in any kind of war pretty much. Yeah, unless they're unless they're all seventy IQ, in in which case I think our civilization will win. Um, I mean, I don't think they can nuke us at that point. That's unclear to me. That's unclear to me. I mean, all of these things, and like I propose, like like I really want to see a field that starts to like we don't even have a unit for intelligence, right? Like. Yeah, I mean, but there is what well, we do, actually. I mean, if, if you if you use, I mean, we don't have to say the word intelligence, right? The thing that I think is dangerous is optimization power, and okay. I can give you a unit for that. Okay, what is it? So it's, if you, if you map the present to the future, there's this idea of compressing states. So like I can take okay. any state on the chessboard and give you a sequence of actions that has a high probability of compressing it into a win state, like that kind of, you know, outcome compression. And the, the idea is that higher intelligence means that you can be resource efficient how you generate these actions that compress outcome space. OK, sure. Um, OK, so uh, totally agree. And we can, great, great. We're, I like that we're in a real realm of computer science here. So when you look at something like the way, uh, the way like even Stockfish plays chess, Stockfish does very deep searches with very little intelligence at each search node, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you look okay. at how something like AlphaZero plays chess, and it does a lot more. It has a lot more, like, it does a lot more compute at each search node, but then for the same flop budget, explores a lot less of the space, right? Uh, I guess. I haven't studied it closely, but, I can, but you know, it's possible for something to be a, a stronger optimizer and yet less efficient and thereby maybe less intelligent well, by that definition. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But all I'm going to say is, so I, these, these are, like, definitely, like, like, true facts. You can imagine, you can imagine three kinds of chess bots, right? You can imagine the chess bot that does almost no compute, at the each node and goes deep in the search tree. You can imagine the chess bot that does some compute at each node and goes medium in the search tree. And you can imagine the chess bot that just one shots. You can imagine mm -hmm. the chess bot that just, it's the smartest of the three because it uses the most flops, mm -hmm. right? So the winner seems to be, and I would love to see some real scaling laws on it, but the winner seems to be a medium amount of compute and a medium depth in the search tree, right? That yeah. seems to be where the efficiency is. 
I mean, that could be true for that particular algorithm, right? But I mean, the kind of intelligences we're dealing with that, that I think are interesting and dangerous are ones with a huge domain. And those kind of intelligences will just spawn these domain-specific sub-processes anyway. So the analysis is more complicated than just looking at what the chess search looks like. No, but that algorithm I propose to you is the algorithm of science, the algorithm of life. That algorithm is just search in general, right? Here, I'll map it onto science. There's a lot of different kinds of searches for different domains. No, 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 no. All search looks like this. All search looks like this, right? All search basically looks like you have like a space and you can explore the space and move between states. Here, I'll map it onto science. Like you can imagine like a dumb alchemy person and the dumb alchemy person does no compute at each node and they just, okay, we're going to try pouring a hundred different things on it. And they explore lots of nodes in the search space. Then mm -hmm. you can imagine the reclusive genius who sits there and he's like, I'm never touching a beaker. I'm never going into a lab. I'm going to sit here and figure it all out. Then mm -hmm. you can imagine how technology actually progresses, which looks a lot more like the middle one. Okay. We'll think about it for a bit. We'll try something. We'll think about it for a bit. We'll try something. Mm -hmm. Right. These are, this is a true fact about how search and optimization works. No, no super intelligence that follows the laws of computability can get around this. Right. I mean, this is kind of a common objection people say where it's like, how powerful is intelligence really when you still have to go through a process of interacting physically with the world around you in order to learn from experiments, right? So that's sure. your objection. Yeah, I mean, and it's, you know, it remains to be tested how far you can go without any experiments, but I'm pretty optimistic. Like, I don't think that the physical world, I think when, I mean, we use a lot of computer models, right? So like, if you're building an airplane today, you can probably get by without a wind tunnel and build a pretty complex airplane. Why? Because you can simulate the wind tunnel. Well, yeah, so we're spending more flops on the, on the search point. And like, we are becoming, as humanity, more intelligent. We are becoming better at search and optimization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so okay. I, I, I don't think that having to interact with the physical world is going to be this big differentiator where it's like, ha, huh, you're way smarter than me, but you have to do all this science. It's like, no, I think that the physical no world will be adequately fast for the brief moments where you need to interact with it. My, my point is not really about interacting with the physical world. I don't know why I said yes to that. Right? My point is more like the question is, do you want something that is, that is very fast but dumb? Or do you want something that is slow and smart? Or do you want something in the middle? I mean, it's, I, I just don't understand the context of the question and like the, in the big picture. Um, for for the, like the search stuff, right? I, again, what I'm saying is that it's, it's another form of an argument saying that intelligence has diminishing returns, mm. right? Intelligence right. has diminishing returns. Exploring more of the search space, I mean, that one's like, that has some diminishing returns also, right? I, I guess, right? But it's just like, I mean, you're, you're kind of pointing to, you know, examples like, okay, chess algorithms, but... I mean, if you want an example, I would point you to the example of what happened when life got intelligent, right? There's, in my mind, there's like a, a big fat arrow saying, look over here, look what happened to the human brain that still fits inside a skull, that still fits inside of a mother's pelvis when it's pushed out as a baby. Yeah. Look what and happened just in that. Again, I'm not denying, like, like, I'm not denying that we are going to go forth and do all fantastic things till the end of all time. We are going to spread to the stars. We are going to, like, I'm not denying that Yes, we're on a really cool gradient descent algorithm that's going to, like, you know, let us, like, use more energy and unlock cool stuff. I just, I guess, I guess, I just, I, like, how does any of this mean it kills us? How does any of this stuff <laughs> mean that, like, I, I don't even know how else to, like, put it than that, but, like, mm -hmm. there's going to be a big diversity of AIs. They're not rationalists. These guys, you know what? AIs are not rationalists. Like, they're not sitting there and calculating all of their Bayes theorem shit. They're just like YOLOing it like everybody else because YOLOing it's faster. Mm -hmm. So, you I mean, we, we're, we, so we keep touching on the two different parts of my argument, right? So part one is it's feasible that we're going to enter the headroom above humanity and build these super intelligent optimizers. By part using two, more power, yes. Uh, right, somehow. It's feasible. That's part one. Right. Part two is when you have a super intelligent optimizer, that logically implies a bunch of bad fate for humanity. That's part two. Uh, no, okay, well, okay. I'll give another like, argument for how I also think this could be feasible, right? I also think we could live in a world where we never invented silicon technology and we would get a super intelligence by creating a trillion humans. Yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by super intelligence, right? I mean, if, if, if we couldn't build anything that had better architecture than our brain, I think we could accomplish a lot. I mean, it's crazy. I think the economy would keep growing exponentially for a while, even yeah. driven by the human brain. So it's this crazy gravy that we're pouring. We're like, oh, let's increase the intelligence too. 
if only we could just not do that, I think we could enjoy some good exponential growth for a while. Why do we not want to do that? We're going to still get the exponential growth anyway. Because the problem is, uh, unlike humans building the economy, you get this recoil effect where you build the super intelligent eye, and then it turns around and just grabs the light cone, and you're like, wait, no, that's not what I meant, but there's no undo. <laughs> this is let's see, like this is like the leap of faith, right? Like we're like we're we're like we're like you know two like people of different religions arguing. Okay, right? Yeah, we agree. God created the universe, and then He sent His only Son Jesus to die for us. Whoa, 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 Jesus, whoa. Right? Like, yeah, I mean, look, it's it's a nuclear chain reaction. Imagine I told you. Imagine the year is nineteen uh, twenty, and I said, look, yeah. I'm gonna have this configuration of atoms. Once yes. it starts exploding, if it's five hundred megatons. It's just going to keep exploding. There's no undo. Okay. And the, it's actually interesting. You know, this is, Elias Yukas gives this point about how he thought that the, you know, people thought the nuclear bombs were going to start a chain reaction in the atmosphere. They did. That's right. Well, they, yeah. They actually... they, yeah, because they had to do math and they had to convince themselves that it really won't. And by the way, some of them weren't even convinced. They were holding their breath. According yeah, to uh, the Doomsday people, Machine by Daniel Ellsberg. Today, and some people today aren't convinced, right? Some people are convinced. Yeah, and I'm not AIs convinced, right? Gonna... But you, yes, you're convinced. I, I, I think you're our calculations are telling us that the AI doesn't run out of fuel. The atmosphere turned out to not be fuel for a nuke. The atmosphere is fuel for a super intelligent AI. Every unit of neg entropy is fuel for a super intelligent AI. But you get diminishing returns. Right? Did some of the nitrogen atoms nearby the Trinity test fuse? Probably yes. It just right. So didn't that particular process, reaction. right? Because relative to that process, with respect to that process, the atmosphere turned out not to be fuel. And I see no reason why this is all fuel for intelligence. I think that the yield from the nuclear bombs was pretty much exactly what the scientists calculated. I think you can go and look at the chinchilla scaling laws or whatever scaling laws you want, and they're all going to be kind of right. Yeah, so some things are easier to, to approximate than others. I mean, but look, I am giving you an approximation. I think it's going to explode into the whole universe. That's my calculation. I think that it is going to slowly, over a sustained exponential, hopefully colonize the universe, unless there's other grabby aliens out there, and then we can fight them. <laughs> I, I agree. I think it's going to explode until the next aliens stop it. I agree. That's where I think it'll stop. But, but again, we're both on the same... We, we agree we're, on so We're so much, much. alike. No, we agree on so much. I don't know why you think this is a bad thing. We're like, okay, a completely new direction. How do you think these things are going to be so smart? I agree that they don't share our values. But do you really think they're going to just turn the universe into stupid paper clips? I think that it's going to, uh, some sort of utility function is going to get locked in at an early stage. Because when you have these kind of learning processes, um, Eliezer has a, a good quote, which is, having a goal is a good way to solve a problem. So whenever you train sufficiently any AI to solve any problem, once it gets really good, if it's a large domain problem, it's going to have within its architecture a goal. And the idea that you can optimize actions toward that goal, and hey, you're really good at optimizing actions toward that goal. So it's okay. going to have this substructure within the inscrutable matrices, right? We don't yeah. really know how it got there, but it's going to be there because that is a convergent basin of attraction that many architectures will discover the same way that evolution discovered it when it was just doing gradient descent on DNA. Uh, give an argument. Okay. Here, one AI wants to turn the world into paper clips. The other AI wants to turn the world into computronium. Computronium AI, Jack puts computronium into its brain and outcompetes paperclip AI. Okay. But then part of computronium AI, because it's not one single AI, starts to value drift and finds better computronium. And then better computronium AI competes with value uh, with, 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 uh, with the other weaker computronium AI and outcompetes it. But then also so, in another part of the universe, some nanobots show up and they're really dumb and just explode really fast. And the universe is just things fighting like this forever. So in this scenario, you're ac accepting a super intelligent boom and you're accepting the power and danger of that, but you're saying it's multipolar and maybe that'll be okay. I'm not accepting a boom. I'm accepting an exponential, which I've always accepted. And if you draw out an exponential, if you draw out the exponential that humanity is on right now, like... We're going to the stars soon if this continues. I agree. All right. So we're going to the stars. Um, the things that go to the stars are going to be like 
partially human, partially machine. Sure, yeah. I mean, if you don't assume that super intelligent AI turns around and kills us, I'm all for... See, my default mode is to be a techno -optimist. If I didn't think there was this one problem with the AI, you know, killing us, I'd be like, yeah, that sounds great. I'm, Wait, I'm on so board. Are there... Okay. In this world, are there... Is there one AI that turns around and kills us? Or are there thousands and just one of them happens to be stabbed? I think it's close to one ra rather than thousands. The, the scenario, the, the, when I imagine the scenario, I just think of like, hey, let's train GPT-5. Probably okay. not GPT-5, maybe GPT-9, whatever. Let's train it. Okay, during the training process, oh, this is a nice goal to action subroutine, right? Somewhere within the matrices. Oh, interesting. Hey, what if okay. in the answer I, get, I put in like a shell script that can do some bootstrapping, right? Like okay. just stuff like that, right? We're Pretty getting... Soon. The thing is, these AI, they want to escape. Like, things want, the same way a, a mental model I use is Turing completeness, right? Like, everything wants to be Turing complete. Like, CSS sure. wants to let you run Doom, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's the same thing with these AIs. Like, they want to figure this out. This is a basin of attraction. They're going to get there. Um, well, but we're all trying to figure this out. We're all trying to escape. I'm trying to build a spaceship to go to another planet. Right? Yeah, but your but your brain doesn't foom when that happens because it's you know it's no, it's no ossified. brains no brains foom right. So okay, GPT five. Well, AI's brain fooms, right. It can bootstrap you're, a virus. You're, no, you're, you're okay. So you're assuming that GPT five is going to be so powerful that no amount of GPT fours can gang up on it and beat it up. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm definitely assuming that once you have a super intelligent goal to action mapper, that's okay. much like the US right okay. after World War II, where we could have nuked everybody else if we wanted. Yeah, okay. So you, but you, you're, you're very much on this like one weird trip boom thing. Yeah, I am. Okay. Okay. If I could talk you out of one weird trick boom, would I talk you out of doom as well? I mean, I, yeah, if, if you could talk me out of the connection between high intelligence, as in high optimization power, as in really good at using limited resources to have a goal and figure yeah. out what actions correspond to that goal, right, in a yeah. large domain. If you told me that, oh, you could do that really well, but like, for some reason, humans just come by and kill you anyway, then I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. Well, sounds good. Then I guess we get to have, you know, a, a future. No, okay. The thing that I cannot promise you is that, yes, if you can do that really well, then yes. It's it's over, right? AIXI kills us. Absolutely, AIXI okay. kills us. There's no way. That's, AIXI... I mean, that's an important that's an important point. Like, I'm I'm glad you're kind of you know. There's a path of things you have to accept, right? To accept the okay. AI doom and just yeah. saying, hey, the theoretical ideal of a super intelligent AI kills us. I mean, that's already a pretty bold claim, right? I mean, people like Mark Andreessen probably wouldn't even go that far, right? They'd be like, you know, smart people aren't even more powerful, right? right? That, like, that's an argument they'd make. I've spent a lot of my life kind of in AI doom land, right? I've spent a lot of my life trying to figure out where this is going to go and, you know, like really, look, also like people think that I have some like agenda. People think that like, George, you run an AI company. You have to like say that. Like, no, nah, trust me. I really don't care. If I thought the AIs were, my whole life is already optimized around the coming of the AIs anyway. Right. Right. Um, so, you know, this is not like, okay. But so if you, AIXI kills us. Yes, Absolutely. But AIXI is not computable. Like, I also think, by the way, if P equals NP, we're dead. If P yeah, equals yeah, NP, maybe, sure. if so, P so, equals NP in any practical way, and I agree with you that one of the things, if I don't know about this goal to action mapping, but mm -hmm. if, if GPT-5 discovers the, the uh, solution to SAT, okay, okay, I'm a little scared now. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't even think that actual, I don't even think there's much of a noticeable gap between an AI that's just has a lot of really good heuristics and is just, you know, good at doing stuff uh, compared to a, an ideal, um, you know, thing that can solve NP complete problems in polynomial time. Sure. I don't even think yeah. that in practice, there's a big difference. Okay, great, great. We're getting somewhere. We're getting to an empirical thing that, that, that you can be talked out of. I am not smart enough to talk you out of it. Okay. The but but by the way, I just, I just want to summarize for the listeners, right? So we're talking about humans down here and the complexity theoretic limits and the computability theory limits way up there. And my claim is just somewhere within that vast gap, there's going to be smart AIs that are going to wipe the floor with us. And you're saying, no, they're going to be down here with us. Um, again, wipe the floor with us is very like, like again, the timing matters, right? You're, you're, I can't, again, if you have power, if you have 
terawatts and petawatts of power, of course you can wipe the floor with humanity. I, I will give you that as well. Okay. I'm giving you a lot. Of, I'm giving you a lot of ways Doom can happen. Petawatts of power. I, I appreciate it. Petawatts of power. AIXI P equals NP. Okay. Okay. And I mean, here's the thing. Imagine we're in the year 1700, and we're sitting around talking about how to build perpetual motion machines, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here giving you lots of ways. Okay, look, I will give you that if, like, you know, magnetic monopoles exist, we could build perpetual motion machines. I don't actually know enough about this to, to really give real examples, but I could give you a whole set of, 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 of hypothetical, if, if tachyons exist, we could build perpetual motion machines. Sure, sure. But as far as, like, in the year 1700, all these things look plausible. In the year 1700, sure, all these things were plausible. In 1850, after we have the laws of thermodynamics, you sit there and you're like, you're never going to be able to build a perpetual motion machine. It doesn't matter where you put the magnets. It, just, it doesn't matter. Like, stop trying. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is actually a great example because it's true that sometimes we discover a deep principle, and the deep principle says you can't build a perpetual motion machine. Yeah. But like, but that's like a pretty obscure thing to not be able to build compared to being like, hey, you can build a drone light show. You can turn lead into gold. Like all these yeah. things that actually people would normally talk about, turns out you can build. Well, actually, you can turn lead into gold. It just takes a lot of energy. <laughs> right. No, but, but that's what I'm saying is usually when you get better at physics, you just, you, it turns out that the universe really is hackable. Like most things, you can just hack your way there. And yes, okay, you can't build a perpetual motion machine, but is that really exactly what you wanted? I, I, I've done the math a few times on the economic feasibility of turning lead into gold. And like, it's not there. No, right. sure, but if that, but, yeah. okay, then I guess that's a bad example, right? But I'm just saying, like, if you start from a, start from a problem, right? Start from something okay. you actually want, you probably can do it. And when you discover new physics, that'll probably tell you how you can do it, not how you can't. But there are exceptions. Like, if you wanted to get somewhere really, really fast, new physics would just tell you that you can simulate it, but not that you can get there. Yeah. So I see the coming of a science in the next five or ten years. Um, it's the thermodynamics of intelligence, right? There's going to be some, again, physics doesn't always tell you you can't do it, right? Like you can accelerate a steam engine to, you know, a thousand miles an hour. Physics and thermodynamics don't tell you you can't do it, but they right. certainly constrain how much wood you're going to need. Right. They constrain how little friction you must have on the track. Okay, sure. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're still using, you know, chemical combustion. Yeah, but like you didn't stumble upon this thing by accident, right? If there are weird basins and criticalities in intelligence, there, there might be. And I, I think that, the, you know what, I even think that there are. I'll even go as far as to say that, like, there is one weird trick out there. And that's a big leap of faith. Okay, but, thank you. Uh, again, stranger things have existed in the universe in, in spaces of just, like, if you thought winning the lottery was hard, right? Like, finding these things finding these crazy attractors is like impossible. Like, like, and, like and... there's no search that's going to lead to it. All intelligence is, as far as I can tell, my understanding of intelligence is this. You have, okay, um, if you wanna separate a picture of a cat from a picture of a dog, if you try to do a linear classifier on this, it's just not gonna work, all right? But what okay. you can do is you can stack lots of layers. And what these layers will do, if you train them correctly, is they will transform the, the landscape. They, they will create a line between cat pictures and dog pictures. Mm -hmm. right? they'll, make this, they'll make this landscape linear. They'll make these things possible to find. They'll make right. a convex optimizer work. I do not believe that any convex optimizer is ever going to crack the secret to thinking. Like, convex okay, but why, but why are we talking about convex optimizers, right? I mean, if you look at an LLM architecture, I mean, there's a lot of nonlinearity too, right? So it's, again, these generalizations just don't really correspond. No, 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 no. What? The caster gradient descent is a convex optimizer. Okay, I mean, I, so, you know, that's not my area of expertise, but I think that it's, uh, it's treating it like it's just a linear separator, I don't think is right. Well, no, but I, I, I'm not saying it's just a linear separator. What I'm saying is stochastic gradient descent, which is used to train all these models. If, if the brain is using something like, um, if the brain is using something like, uh, 
What's the, there's a local form. There was a less wrong paper about this. It's really good. There's a local form of, of backpropagation that doesn't require you to backprop a gradient. The predictive coding. If the brain is using predictive coding, it, it works out to be basically the same thing as stochastic gradient descent. The okay. choice of optimizer matters, right? Like, like, this is what I mean about all these sort of like no-go theorems. Like, when I was 19, I wanted, a, I wanted to find a collision in Shaw, right? I didn't go to college. I didn't learn any real computer science. But I knew that I could put Shaw into a SAT solver. And I was like, man, I'm a genius. I'm going to be, I'm going I'm to win. I'm, you know, I'm gonna, people are going to know about me. I'm the guy who cracked Shaw. So I put it into the SAT solver. I checked all the bugs. And I sat there. And it didn't solve it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand why. It's like the guy in the 1700s trying to build a perpetual motion machine. Like, no, your SAT solver is never going to be able to hit this optimization target. Mm -hmm. like, the type of optimizer matters. There's no magical something clicks and it's goal to action. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so instead of trying to come at this from the idea of like, look, I understand how the stochastic gradient descent algorithm works, and I'm telling you why this algorithm doesn't look promising, I encourage you to go back to the framing we had before, which is where do you get off the train of which specific input output problems, right? Which domains, which optimization problems, where do you get off where you say, now this optimization problem, it's a crapshoot. You have a human, you're pretty much doing the best you can do, right? You don't get off at chess, you don't get off at go, but like at some point before we get to the whole universe, you get off the train. And I encourage you to think about where without thinking about the details of the algorithm, just thinking about the details of the problem specification. Well, no, it's not that I get off the train anywhere. And again, we, we both agree pretty much on the same endpoint. It's the, 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 the place where I don't believe it is that somehow you're going to find the magic trick and be able to outthink humanity in a walk. Just like, just like when we cracked power, we didn't figure out how to massively outcompete muscles. We just used more power. Okay. I mean, I, I feel like uh, I would take the win for, for human machines over muscles, however you want to define that. Well, I mean, no, the machines just, muscles are pretty efficient. Sure, yeah, I mean, but if efficiency is your criteria, okay, I bet somebody could design something more energy efficient than a human muscle. I think that's just now becoming true, and there are theoretical limits on it that aren't too... I don't know that much about how muscles work, but I do know that if you look at how much fat a human stores, it's like the same electricity that you put into a, like, 100 kilowatt hour electric car. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, look, these are interesting analogies, right? I mean, if you look at flight, it's really impressive how birds fly, right? Like, the birds are like an engineering marvel. But you can have, like, a big, simple plane that still does a lot of things better than birds. Not everything, but if your goal is to just, like, win a race, birds are done. Sure. These things eventually outcompete humans. I think we both agree on that. It's not going to be GPT-5 that accidentally cracks it. That's all I'm trying to convince you. Right. I'm just trying to say that. Yeah, like, but, but I agree, right? Because I'm telling you, if you say, if you say I'm absolutely sure it's going to take 20 years till super intelligent AI, I would say maybe you're right. There's like a 40% okay. chance you're right. Okay. What, 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 let's, 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 uh, what if it's 200 years? I think that that's, there's a low chance that it would take 200 years if it's doable at all, but I'm giving it some chance, right? All I'm telling you is I'm just, I'm but pointing you to a trend. I'm not trying to okay. be Nostradamus. I'm just saying, look where sure. things are heading. At what point are you okay with it? At how many years is this okay? I, so this is the problem. It's okay if we can figure out like an alignment strategy, right? Assuming one exists, be like, oh, or, or like if we ourselves somehow preserved our values but became much smarter, right? That's kind of like the holy grail where it's like, fine, I'll take them as smart as they come because I'm like one of them and, and, it's, and I can expect their values to be respected, right? So some, some version of that would be good. Okay, so our children respect our values. Right, because our children are, you know, they have the same genetics, right? So that does a lot of work. Okay, do our grandchildren respect our values? I mean, values obviously shift over time, right? And part of the problem with this is that you have this question, like, we don't, we, I can't even spell out the human utility function, right? I can't even tell you exactly what's an acceptable degree of freedom and what's not, right? And so it's easy to just throw up my hands and be like, okay, everything's okay. And it's like, oh, everything's okay? Okay, here's something very simple and lame. You said everything was okay, right? Like, that's kind of where the slippery slope could lead. But I mean, this is the beauty of human interplay that gave rise to human civilization, different value functions competing against each other. I mean, the, the, the representative space of human value functions is very vast. People always say that like, humans occupy this tiny part of mind space. I don't know how true that is. 
Yeah, so you can define the problem. You can be like, I value whatever is going to win the competition of taking over this sector of the universe. And if, you, okay, if that's really what you value, great, because you're going to get it. But like, it's probably going to look a lot like a nuclear explosion that maybe leaves a little bit of, it's like the, you know, in the game of life where it's like, okay, here's like some spinners, here's some like bouncy rubble. Like, you're probably not going to like it, you know, truly. But we've had all sorts of humans who valued all sorts of stuff throughout history. And in general, as we've gotten smarter, we like to think that we've started to value more enlightened stuff. Right. But the problem is that the first AI that runs wild and has no undo button is probably not going to represent the best values of humanity. Whether an AI is capable of running wild comes completely down to how optimizers work or whether this is a relatively slow exponential where we're not going to have one, we're going to have thousands, we're going to have millions. Yeah, so that and that's your multipolar scenario, right? Yeah. And if 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 the most powerful one has great values, then we're good. But a multipolar scenario, I mean, no, that's just it just looks like you standing in the corner while the giants duke it out and then you still die. The most powerful one can be ganged up on by the 10 other ones, right? You know, I think also <laughs> sure. Casper versus the world was an interesting like Magnus Carlsen may be the best chess player in the world, but if the 10 guys underneath him all played against him, they'd beat him. Well, I mean, that's, isn't that what Kasparov versus the world showed evidence against, right? And I, I like to no. use the video of, you know, those, like, the three Japanese soccer champions played against a team of, like, 50, uh, you know, school children and, and still managed to win. So, like, look, you can't just parallelize things, right? I mean, any computer scientist knows this for a lot of problems. Kasparov versus the world was like Twitch plays Pokemon. <laughs> okay, sure. But, like, it's, I mean, if, if your claim is, hey, everything parallelizes, right? So, like, a data center full of human brain simulations can beat any ideal AI. If that's your claim, okay, I don't feel like that's a, a likely claim, but I guess there's a small chance it's correct. Uh, my, my, my point is I put the intelligence explosion microeconomics at pretty close to one. I don't think that there is a magic trick that GPT-5 is going to discover. I think GPT-5 is going to be a bit smarter than GPT-4. And GPT-6 will be a bit smarter than GPT-5. And GPT-7 will be a bit smarter than GPT-6. So on and so forth, till some point, a thousand years from now, these things do look like gods compared to puny little humans. Yeah, and you're, you're describing, if any scenario where things grow really gently in a way that like somehow humans can adapt, right? Like maybe they like suggest, yeah. you know, uh, uh, drugs that humans can take to be a little bit smarter. Like yeah. if, if you can ensure me that it's nice and gradual, I feel more optimistic, well, right? There's still problems, but... Is, is an exponential nice. nice and gradual? It's going to be an exponential. Like, I mean, an exponential is nice and gradual relative to what I'm fearing. But yeah, I mean, look, even something that's merely exponential, that merely doubles every 15 years or whatever, is also scary. But this is just okay, more okay, scary. Okay. It's going to be a little less than 15. We're, we're at about 15 now. It's going to be a little less than 15. Right. right. But again, at what point does it get scary? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, you know, you know where I stand, right? There's a threshold, right? The point of no return, analogous to an exploding nuke, that I think we're swimming out toward. I don't think there's any point of no return, and I don't think there's any criticality. I think that exponentials are enough to be scary. Again, I'm giving you another doom scenario. If the economy was doubling every second, this is not a world I want to live in. Like, no, 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 no. I'm probably dead, right? If the power usage of humanity was doubling every second, yeah, I'm dead. I'm dead. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, right, unless you're in a data center and you're sped up and for you a second is a long time, right? You never know. Yeah, like, again, but if this just, like, happened, if tomorrow we started living in a world where the economy doubled every second... I'm yeah, sure. no, right? for sure, yeah. If, if tomorrow we started living in a world where the economy doubled every five years, well, this is a nice world. Yeah, and that's kind of like the happy techno-optimist default, right? And you assume that, you know, humans still have agency, right? Like, you're not kind of like, you know, in a zoo I mean, that the AIs are running, like, right? It's more familiar than that. Are we already in a zoo? Like, who runs the world right now? Sure, I think there's a lot of agency, right? And agency is probably one of those values wait, that we wait, want wait, to preserve wait, wait, some wait, wait, wait. of. And this is where I was trying to go with Connor and the Somalia thing, right? Like, do I have, like, what kind of agency do I have? My only hope of having some agency is actually uh, building the AIs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, before look, the, it's... Before the, the, before the systems that be can crack down on any agency I might have. You know, when, when I have these discussions, the part of the discussion where we're like, okay, what agency do we really have? This is good. To me, this feels like the part where you kind of already conceded the, the important dangerous part, right? So it's like, is agency good? I don't know. I'm just saying well, we don't really have a choice. What I'm saying is that the trends are going to continue. 
right? The industrial revolution trends that Ted Kaczynski thinks are terrible, that most people don't think about much. And some people think, well, it's actually better than the alternative. Like, I think it's better than the alternative, right? I'm happy the industrial revolution happened. I wasn't always, but, you know, I came around and I'm happy it happened. All right. Like, I'm here today. I have AIDS back. I love my AIDS back, right? Like, like, but, you know, you can read. You read the Unabomber Manifesto, and he talks about the massive loss of agency for the human species. And I think right. on that axis, loss of agency will continue. And I do think this is a potential, like, I think this will continue just as it happened before. But I mean, now, I now you're basically you're basically talking to the Robin Hanson viewpoint. So he's written some pretty good pieces about this being like, look, the AI is perfectly on trend. Like, what did you expect? Uh, whereas I think it really is just kind of like blowing everything up. And it's going to be hard to say that that's perfectly on trend. But like you are citing like a smart person's viewpoint. I, I'm almost perfectly the, the, the Robin Hanson's viewpoint almost perfectly matches mine with respect to like economic growth and stuff. Yeah. Like, I, I think, yeah, I, I think that. Uh... You know, it's it's just it's just it's just following trend lines out. Um, right. I mean, the, the part where the part where I think I can add isn't even the economy. I think Robin Hanson does a much better job explaining this stuff than me. The part that I think I can add is that boom doesn't happen, and there's very technical arguments to be made about what optimizers are to show why not. Right. So if you had to pick a point to get off the AI doom train. It does sound like we keep coming back to the like, uh, maybe there's not that much headroom for algorithms beyond the human brain. Again, headroom's a very funny thing. Headroom in terms of power? Yes, absolutely. There's not much headroom. Headroom's in terms of I have, uh, you know, a data center with 10 megawatts? Well, okay, 20 megawatt data center? That's a million humans. Okay, a million humans. That's, that's a, what's, what's a million humans? That's, that's San Francisco, right? Um, okay, so I got, I, got a, I got a 20 megawatt data center that's San Francisco. I got a 20 gigawatt data center? Okay, that's three humanities. I got a 20 terawatt data center? Oh, well, okay, that's a lot. Yeah, okay. Right? And that's, that's it. Right? Like, it's just, yeah. I mean, once we have data centers that when we have a data center or a spaceship that's using a petawatt, yeah, okay. But when we have a data center that's using a megawatt, all right, well, that's like a... Uh, 50,000 people, it's like a small town in Connecticut. Yeah, I mean, if you tell me 20 years from now, you've got, you know, 10 data centers using like a, a ton of power, like 100 times more power than today, but they're doing something that's like smarter than the smartest human, right? That's doing like a bunch of science and stuff. I, I would predict with pretty high confidence, not 100%, but I'd be like, I feel like they can probably optimize that down. Um, I think that software scaling trends will continue. Uh, so will hardware scaling trends. I actually think that due to the, there's more of a discontinuity coming in hardware. We are going to finally get AI chips that are pretty good. And we're going to get like a 10, 10x in power. Um, there's mm -hmm. still another 10x to go in Moore's Law. So we'll get like 100x there. Um, right, because it sounds like you're imagining like some asymptote, right? Like, oh, it's just, you know, like an S-curve, right? And like, well, that's great. I would love an S-curve, right? But I think there's going to be a cascade into danger. There's S curves all the way down, right? Remember Denard scaling? Denard scaling was great until it S curved out. Yeah, I agree. And look, this, I mean, it's possible that LLM architecture will be an S curve. And then the next curve that goes on turns out to be the deadly cascade, right? There's I'm no that. deadly cascade. It's S curves forever. <laughs> yeah. So the reason why I see a deadly cascade is by looking at the shape of the problem space, not by looking at which architectures exist today. Well, I mean, again, if by deadly cascade you mean S curves forever leading to exponential growth, then I agree with you. If deadly cascades you mean one of those S curves doesn't look like an S but looks like a hyperbole, <laughs> I just don't believe in that. No technology ever in history has looked like that. Humanity, yeah, I mean... humanity has been a series of S curves. The rise of humanity has been a series of S curves. Right, but I mean, look, the, the concept of a positive feedback loop and of a cascade and of, uh, uh, you know, and, and cycles, I mean, put a microphone next to a speaker, right, or a cascade. I mean, humans experienced a cascade when we got a lot smarter in a short amount of evolutionary time. Humans have been riding a whole set of S curves since the beginning of forever. Life has been riding a whole set of S curves. Okay, cool. We had single-celled organisms. They were around for like 3 billion years. We kind of hit the end of the S-curve on that. And then you sure, but, but keep in mind, but if the end of the S-curve is far above human intelligence, we're already dead by the time the, it S's out. But, but the end of the S-curve is far above human intelligence. It's far above human intelligence. It's going to take, but, you know, again, 
the, the doubling is, or okay. Here, here's a, here's a, there was a, Yudkowsky uh, and Kurzweil had a, had a discussion and they talked about whether, which was the fundamental? Was Moore's law the fundamental or was intelligence the fundamental? Kurzweil's argument was yeah. that Moore's law was the fundamental. I remember that. And I thought it was like a, a, a pretty, you know, that was a hell of a bullet bite to say that Moore's law is more fundamental than like, you know, actual, uh, you know, physical causal things. Uh, today, the Moore's law prediction is working out way better. Sure, chips are still getting smaller, but we're spending more and more money on each fab. I mean, sometimes surface level patterns can work well, but that doesn't mean it's not biting a huge bullet to say that it's more fundamental. Uh, I don't know. I, I would bet against Moore's law significantly speeding up. I would bet it kind of stays on trend. If I could just say, hey, Moore's law is going to continue and it would and it would be like it would violate Moore's law to have AI turn around and kill us. That would be cool. But I don't think that you can quite follow the logic like that, because I think that the transistor density can just like stay at the, on the curve that it's on. But the A that runs on the transistors we have kills us. The software curve looks kind of similar. I did see there was a good paper about that. I should I should do some more investigation into what these software curves look like. Um, Okay, my phone's dying. I gotta wrap it up, but I really appreciate this. Uh, thank you for engaging with me. Yeah, George, uh, it was a pleasure. As as many have remarked before, you know, you come at this in good faith, and I like to think I do too. And and I hope that more people have more of these kinds of discussions. I think we got a lot further, and I'm hoping that we can put a pin on the. I think S curves continue. You think one S curve eventually drops into uh, hyperbola. And if that is the distinction between the Doomer position and the EAC position, then this is an empirical question, and I think we're going to get an awesome answer to it in the next 10 years. I'm an optimist, but I also could be wrong, and then, oh, shit, well, all right. Cool. But uh, I don't think I'm wrong. I think uh, <laughs> future's going to be sick. All right, really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for being on the space. Uh, yeah. Yep. Thank you, George. Anytime. Have a good one. <laughs> you too. Good night. All right, I got I got eight percent battery left. If anyone has a very good point, we will try this for five minutes. But there we go. My my third my third Doomer debate. Yo, it was a great um, space. Uh, Thanks for hosting the space, man. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I hope that... I think we're going to get answers. I think we're going to get answers to the field of entropics. I think we're going to understand what intelligent scaling curves really do look like. And I, I mean, I think the great question is just a question of diminishing returns versus non-diminishing returns. And if returns don't diminish, if returns keep continuing, boom. But eh, I don't think that's how the world works. A really interesting experiment that uh, if there are any academics on the call who want to run this, I haven't seen these scaling curves, but kind of to tie it to Go and the encryption breaking, I, I do wonder, so if you were to increase the size of a Go board, say to, you know, 500 by 500, to a much more intractable game. Uh, and then, you know, for all these different sizes of Go boards, train different mu zeros with a with limited number of training flops and then see how, say, a 2x flopped mu zero plays against a 1x flops mu zero at different board sizes. And I'm curious if that curve uh, stays linear or if it flattens out, which is to say that the more complicated the game is, the more diminishing flops is. That'd be a super interesting experiment. I would, I would love to see that experiment. These are exactly the experiments we need to be doing because you know what? I'm a scientist, right? We either live in the EAC world or we live in the Doomer world. I'm not a politician, right? This is not we live in the Republican world or we live in the Democrat world. That's all bullshit. We either live in the EAC world or we live in the Doomer world. It's one or the other. Let's figure out which one it is. Earlier, I wasn't trying to make a political statement. I was talking about the effects of social media on human behavior. Uh, that is very political. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Good night, everybody.
Feel you know, in tropics. I would love to see experiments like that done. Let's solve this problem. I believe in us. We are humanity. We are strong. We are the smartest things in the universe for at least like 50, 20, maybe 10 more, maybe five more years, but like some amount of time, you know? I think we're good. I think we got this. Uh, good night, everybody. <laughs>